from Psalm 34. I would encourage you to read the entire psalm, but I'm going to read two verses and then pray for us before we hear from God's Word this morning. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. As we were praying this week and again this morning as we were singing, I wanted to remind each of us that Christianity is not a ladder that we climb in order to get nearer to God. Christianity is more like what you saw yesterday during that beautiful summer thunderstorm where the water that rushed from heaven and filled your drain spouts flowed to the lowest point on your property. The reason we can see, as Mike so eloquently reminded us, Christ is with us in the dark spaces, is not because you're there. It's because Christ is there. He pursues those who are in the lowest spaces because that's the difference between religion, which climbs up a ladder, does religious things to get near to God, and grace, which draws near to those who are brokenhearted. Aren't you glad? And if ere we forget that, we need to spend more time looking at the cross and less at the ladders in our lives. So I want to pray. I want to pray for us, not only that we would personally experience that, but the sense this week was that for many of us, if not all of us, we are in the position right now to listen to those who are in low places. And if we're going to speak, may we speak about the God who is gracious and seeks them. Let's pray. Lord, we're grateful for the reminder from the Psalms of the truth of the gospel that our God hears our cries for help and draws near to the brokenhearted. Thank you, Jesus, for we see that exquisitely displayed on Calvary in dying for sinners and being raised again for our salvation through faith and repentance. Lord, we can be declared, as we just sung, righteous, forgiven, and free. Lord, we do pray for us in this season where we are listening to the cries of people around us. I pray, Lord, you would give us ears to hear the heart that is before us. Not the heart before us on necessarily a screen, but the heart of the person that we are loving, that through tears and anguish and questions, Lord, is sharing their innermost with us. Give us wise words to share that speak of your grace and mercy that flows to the lowest place in order to raise us by faith to Christ. Lord, use us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, welcome to our, uh, I believe this is our third service what we're calling Regathering Sundays. And for those of you that are joining us for the first time, welcome. Great to have a few more people here. And thank you for following CDC guidelines even while you're here by wearing masks and maintaining social distancing. The downstairs is now open, uh, not the classrooms, but the fellowship hall, the restrooms, of course, uh, and the kitchen area, although we ask you not to use the kitchen. So you, you can take advantage of those spaces if you need be. I particularly want to give a shout out to the kids who are here. It is great to see you. We miss you in children's ministry. And although it's a privilege to share from God's word, I look forward to the day when we can resume children's ministry downstairs uh, with you, whatever that will look like. 
Speaking of children's ministry, our next lesson will be next Sunday, I hear, so that's something to look forward to. That will be online. Please turn in your scriptures to Acts chapter 17. We're continuing our series, which we've entitled The Triumph of the Word. And this morning we're going to look at 15 verses from Acts chapter 17. Uh, And in the providence of God, in His ordering of events, we're going to read about a riot in a city that was instigated by those who opposed the gospel and about a noble way to receive God's word each and every day, even in the midst of unrest. Acts chapter 17, this is God's word. May he give me the grace to speak from it this morning and you the grace as you follow along to listen. Now, when Paul and Silas had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in as was his custom and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead and saying, this Jesus who I proclaim to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous and taking some wicked men of the rabble They formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also, and Jason has received them, And they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them, therefore, believed, with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea, Also, they came there too, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Then the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea, but Silas and Timothy remained there. Those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and after receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed." concludes the reading of God's word. Let's pray. Father, in the few moments we have together, Lord, as the psalmist prays in Psalm 119, verse 135, Lord, would you cause your face to shine upon us and give us understanding of your law that we might walk in your statutes this day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning we're considering two episodes in chapter 17, one from the city of Thessalonica and one from the city of Berea. We are meant, I believe, to see the similarities and differences between the two. Similarities in this sense, both of these episodes are very similar. In both, Paul begins when he visits the city by preaching in a synagogue. While he preaches, 
a divergence of opinion forms. Some believe, others do not. The crowd is stirred up, controversy ensues. And then they have to move to the next town. So Paul went to Thessalonica and also to Berea, and on the face of it, it seems both cities had the same kind of reaction, except yet, although there was controversy in both places, we notice that Luke highlights for us the response of those Jewish believers in Berea. For many in Thessalonica, they had a far different attitude, although they were Jewish, to the Word of God than the Bereans did to the Word of God. And so I believe that this section in Acts perfectly demonstrates for Theophilus, the original recipient of not only Acts, but the Gospel of Luke, which were bound together, what it means for him and what it would mean for us to affirm the authority of the Word of God. This section perfectly demonstrates what it means for us to affirm the authority of the Word of God. Paul will persuade some from the scriptures that Jesus is their king and ours and gives us his reasons to treasure him by. But as we look at these two episodes, this also tells me, and it should tell you, I believe, that our behavior towards the Bible reflects what we really believe about the Bible. If I were to sum that up in a point for reflection, If we are to be the people of Christ, we must be a people of the book. If we are to be the people of Christ, we must be a people of the book. Many people right now are praying for a revival and renewal in this nation. Praise God. But there has been no genuine movement or revival in any nation apart from a new hunger for the Word of God. And if that is true, whenever I see God working in my heart, or you see God working in someone else's heart, one of the surest signs that it's God and not dinner was that there is a renewed hunger for the Word of God. This passage demonstrates what it means not only to affirm Jesus as king, but what it means to affirm the functional, daily, personal, frequent, practical authority of the scriptures by which I treasure him by. If we are to be the people of Christ, we must be a people of this book. Let's look at the scriptures together. First point, wherever there is believing, there are reasons for our belief. Wherever there is believing, there are reasons for our belief. Luke tells us that Paul and Silas have come to Thessalonica. As the leader of the Gentile mission in the early church, the gospel ministry of Paul is working its way westward towards Rome, and as Paul and his associates preached in Macedonia, which would be northern Greece, Caia, and then the Asias, they find themselves, having been urged to leave Philippi, the end of last chapter, now making the hundred-mile journey southwest along the main Roman road, the Via Ignatius, to the port city of Thessalonica. We're not told how they got there, but it does appear, even at this early stage, that Paul has a strategy. It appears that Paul deliberately heads for the larger cities of the empire, cities such as Corinth, Ephesus, Rome, 
and Thessalonica. Thessalonica was a provincial Roman capital of Macedonia, northern Greece. In other words, it was a place of Roman administration and influence, not unlike our city of Boston or our city of Providence. Both were port cities, as was Thessalonica, so they were prosperous port cities. Both were crossroads for regions, 95, north and south, and is it 90 that goes, moves south and all the way, or east all the, or west all the way to Seattle? Thessalonica had major roads, 20 feet wide roads built by Romans or their forced laborers linking the empire. These are cities that are connected to its head, meaning they are connected vitally to its capital. And lastly, as a result, due to all the visitors that came, they were religiously pluralistic. So Paul, Luke tells us in verse 2, spent three Sabbath days in Thessalonica. It's a brief campaign. So in other words, he spent two to three weeks in this major city. But it's a campaign of consequence, as we learn from Luke's account, because Paul's preaching, verse 2, was persuasive. I'll read the verse again. And Paul went in, as was his custom, to the synagogue. And on three Sabbath days reasoned with them from the Scriptures, verse 3, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, saying, and here we have his summary of his sermon. He certainly said much more than this. This Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. That's his message, the clearest summary right there. And apparently they heard it because in verse 7, during the protest, they recite what Paul said when they dragged Jason before the city magistrates, perhaps his host, while they were in the city. They said of Paul and his followers, they're all defying Caesar's decrees, saying there is another king, one called Jesus. That's the summary of Paul's message. Jesus, the one I am proclaiming to you, is the Messiah, is the king of the Jews, the promised anointed one through whom the nations will be blessed. What Luke highlights, though, is Paul's method. Verse 2, 3, and 4. He describes Paul's ministry in the synagogue of one of, well, he uses four wonderful verbs. I know there's nothing wonderful for many of us about verbs, if you stunk in grammar as I did, but these are wonderful verbs. These are inspired verbs. At least that's what I'm told to say. Paul reasoned, Paul explained, Paul proved, and Paul proclaimed. He reasoned from the scriptures. He explained the scriptures. He proved his reasonings, his arguments, his claims from the scriptures, and he proclaimed. In other words, these four verbs had resonance with their audience as means of persuasion. Now, this is fascinating to me, friends, because his audience all has, if they're Jews, a Jewish expectation of a Messiah. In other words, he's got home field advantage. It's like arguing to Red Sox fans that um, Pedro Martinez is one of your greatest pitchers or the greatest pitcher ever or whatever. It, it's, it seems like it wouldn't be necessary to reason, explain, prove, and proclaim. And yet he does. It begs the question, not only for these people, but for you and I. How is it that some of us believed what we believed when we became Christians? And how do we become fully persuaded so that we remain committed to anything at all? How is it that some of us 
believed what we believed when we first came to Christ? And how do we remain committed, particularly in times of uncertainty? How do we remain persuaded and therefore committed to anything at all? Tim Keller has written a wonderful article. You can find it if you Google deconstructing defeater beliefs. But he made the argument that Paul connects the gospel to his audience's cultural narrative. To put it in simple terms, Paul connects Jesus to their story. And in connecting it to their story, he doesn't simply appeal to their emotions or their experience, but he reasons with them based on that story. He connects the dots for them in light of that story. He builds an argument in light of that story. You notice the word reason in verse 2? It's, it's where we get the word dialogue. In other words, his ministry in the synagogue was a conversation. He was speaking in a way that people understood him and knew they were having a conversation with him. Verse 3 where it says explained, it means he opened their minds to their past experience. Proved. It says he set something before them, one commentator defined it as, that they could see it with their eyes. They could taste it, if you will, metaphorically. They could walk around it. They could, they could touch what he was saying. He wasn't simply making a proclamation and then calling them to respond. He was setting something before them like a good meal and letting them taste it. And then he proclaimed He did call for a response. Christ is king. He fulfilled the promises of God. He died on the cross as our substitute. He rose again. There is forgiveness in the name of Christ. In other words, wherever there is believing, there is reasons for our believing. And it is those reasons for which we need to be continually persuaded if we are going to remain firm. Some were persuaded, verse 4. Paul must have made a good point. Some even joined Paul and Silas. I'm not sure what they did. Maybe they joined the church there in Thessalonica. We have two letters in the New Testament earliest of Paul's letters written to that group. Perhaps that's what they joined. Or perhaps they in some way joined Paul on his mission. Perhaps. But whatever their believing is, they were belonging to something. As John Stott has written, wherever there is believing, there is always belonging. There is no believing apart from belonging to the people of God. Paul reasons, he explains, he proves, and believes. For a nominal believer, for someone who's listening perhaps, you're exploring Christianity otherwise, I don't imagine you'd be giving me five minutes of your time. What reasons would you have for not being more committed to your faith? And what promises from scriptures does Jesus make to you to help you overcome? And for an unbeliever, if you are listening, welcome. Why haven't I given Christianity more of a chance? There are reasons for that. What reasons might the scriptures give that provide an alternate viewpoint and explanation? But as we see in this passage, the message of Jesus goes forth to from whom a king is revealed, to whom all allegiance is owed. And some are persuaded, but that is not the only thing that is happening. As we look at verse 5, 
there is religious hostility from others. Persuasion of some, religious hostility from others. Civil unrest follows in the city. A mob forms instigated by Paul's opponents. And as I looked at that, it does indicate they are Jewish, but they're not only Jewish. Apparently there were rabble rousers in the crowd that were incited to be a part of this mob that set the city in an uproar, that attacked the house of Jason, that dragged him out. What might be the source of their hostility? Where might it come from? I understand, as does any Christian believer, that there will not be uniform acceptance to the gospel message where it is preached. But where might their hostility come from, particularly those who were in the synagogue and were familiar with the claims of Scripture. Some were glad to accept it. Some were glad to squelch it. Verse 5 says, there was jealousy, but the Jews were jealous who opposed Paul. And man, they were they were deliberate in their jealousy. I don't know, does Nick Jonas sing about this? I mean, he, they follow Paul all the way to Berea out of their jealousy to oppose him. That was an attempt at humor. It went over very badly. <laughs> I am not saying that all who disagree with Christianity are jealous. There are, and oftentimes, very real, honest, intellectual questions that need to be answered. There are people genuinely searching for answers. But I think in terms of this group, I want to submit to you that the Jews who opposed Paul were jealous because they were biased against him and they were personally prejudiced about him. And so they couldn't listen to what Paul was saying. And that's my second point. Wherever there is believing, there is resistance due to bias and personal prejudice. And I think Luke wants to draw that contrast for Theophilus that these individuals who were picking a fight with Paul, no matter how smart they are, no matter how much they may assume they are impartial, can be easily blinded by personal prejudice or bias and therefore not hear God speaking to them. This may surprise you, but when I was growing up, I had a bias, I know this dates me, to men who wore earrings or really any kind of jewelry, which I know is just absurd, tattoos and motorcycles. I was told, (laughs) I love my parents, that if I did any of those things, I'd be disinherited on the spot. But I kind of had a bad attitude towards men with jewelry, tattoos, and this is in the 70s, so I know all those things are... So isn't it kind of God that the first time I heard the gospel was from someone in study hall who didn't meet two of those things. And why I struggled to listen to him was not because the gospel wasn't true or powerful, because I was biased and prejudiced against him. But then when one of his friends, who was now a believer, came, who was captain of the hockey team, soccer team, excuse me, this is Pennsylvania, Good-looking dude. I listened to him differently. And then when his friend came, who was functionally the president of the class and most likely to be successful, I bought in. Now, God was kind. He can do anything he wants. But my bias and my prejudice towards earrings, tattoos, and motorcycles. Am I the kind of person 
that rejects the claims and truths of the book due to biases and prejudices and personal preferences. This season that we're in has me doing soul searching on that regard, on another issue. And I have noticed that when John Piper speaks, my email and my attention explodes. But when others of a different pigment have said the same thing, they haven't gotten the same hearing, the same tension. Even though they're Reformed, Reformed Baptist, teaching in seminary. So I'm doing some soul searching. But in terms of this passage, friends, these individuals rejected God and his Savior not because Paul was unreasonable, but because of their personal prejudice. And therefore their accusations, although having elements of truth in them, when they say that Paul is claiming that Jesus is a kind of Caesar, verse 7, and therefore there's another king, and this is disloyal to the emperor, this is seditious, there's treason as it goes against other parts of Scripture which call for Christians to, to honor the emperor unless their conscience is violated, to pay taxes to, to the emperor, to submit to the governing authorities. I think their accusations are misleading, but there's an element of truth here where what they were saying makes the message of the gospel difficult to hear, not because Paul was wrong in what he was saying, it's because wherever there is believing, there is resistance to belief due to bias and personal prejudice, which makes then the response of the noble Bereans all the more astonishing. Verse 10, the brothers immediately send Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, and when they arrive, as is their custom, they go to the Jewish synagogue. And here, verse 11, there were Jews, Luke says, that were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. The results, many of them therefore believed with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea also, they came there too, agitating and stirring up the crowd. My final point, wherever there is believing, the scriptures, the scriptures must be given the last word. Wherever there is believing, the scriptures must be given the last word. In contrast to many, not all, of the Jewish people in Thessalonica, the Jewish people in Berea, in the synagogue, Luke says were more noble. Noble in this sense, not that they were wealthy or more educated, not that they, had, they were part of an aristocracy or or had royal blood in their bloodline, they were more noble in their response to the word of God. Verse 12 says they were eager to hear the word. It says the Berean Jews were persistent in studying it. Daily they examined it. Verse 12, every day they examined it. They wanted to see if Paul's word aligned with God's word. And so they were looking into these things. It says they searched the scriptures to see if Paul's message had divine authority. In their minds, the Bereans, there was only one way Paul's message would have God's authority, and that is if it went to accord with God's word. So I'm sure as he was walking them through Psalm 2 and Psalm 16 and Psalm 110 and Isaiah 9 and 11 and 53. It demonstrated to them that what Paul was saying was indeed in complete comportment with the Word of God. 
And therefore, the Bible, their Old Testament, was the final word, the last word, to which there could be no other. And I think we're meant to see the difference in their character when it comes to their posture and it comes to the word of God's position and influence in their lives. These Bereans were more reasonable, open-minded, laudable, therefore, in their posture and position for the word. So do we see what Luke is doing for Theophilus? He's saying to his original recipient of this incredible book, Theophilus being an elite, high-ranking official, drawing the contrast between the the rabble-rousers of Thessalonica and the noble Bereans, Theophilus, do you want to follow Christ? How do you handle the Word of God? Let me give us four suggestions. And I'm thankful for a book which I brought but is not with me that Kevin DeYoung wrote. We highlighted it several years ago. um, A series of messages he did on the Word of God. And so these four suggestions to apply this principle of being a people of the book Let me encourage you to do what you have done during our 20-year history together. Listen to every sermon preached from this pulpit, whether it be Bauer, Dave, or Dan, with an open Bible. That doesn't mean literally right now you have your Bible. In fact, some of you have screens and they're glowing on your mask. But a speaker does not have authority outside of the scripture. Yes? Amen? Amen. Thank you. So the reason we want our Bibles open, if not now, later, is so that the sermon that you're hearing is found in the Word of God. That's why we try to preach expositionally, weak or in need of improvement as I am because we're seeking to exposit the text, show you, put our finger in the text. If you find this is a church where we can preach sermons with your Bible closed, please go to another church. We don't want to be that kind of church. We want to be the kind of church where, not literally, but figuratively, the pages are rustling, the screens are glowing. Because the Bible is the book of God's words. Maybe more importantly for us, certainly more importantly for me, is don't rush on from the word work God is doing in your life. You notice that the Bereans did something that I struggle to do. They made time and they exerted effort, having heard Paul to examine the scriptures, notice, every day. Every day, it says, verse 12. And I need to find time, unhurry time in the word of God. I know the season we're in, and the Lord understands that. And even when we're not in seasons like this, I know the seasons many of our parents are in, and the Lord understands that. And I know the season many of our men and women who are working, believe me, I now understand that with fresh, realities, but we need unhurried time in the Word of God. Linda recently, she cooked a roast in a crock pot. I could probably do a crock pot roast. It looks pretty simple to me. But she starts it like during devotions in the morning. I mean, it's like 8 or 9 in the morning, and all of a sudden you're smelling roast beef, kind of like your girl, Kira. And by lunchtime, you're standing over that thing and saying, mmm, mmm, this smells good. Are we going to eat this now? And she says, oh, no. This is going to cook for five more hours. Five more hours! You know, you're wiping away the Oh, but then dinner comes out, and out comes that roast, and it is tender. (sighs) Mm. Those juices have been simmering all day. 
Then later, for dessert, it's hard to imagine we can afford dessert after that. Maybe we're going to watch something, and one of my daughters will do microwave popcorn. For the illustration, they don't do microwave popcorn, but I'm going to say they do. They do microwave popcorn, and you can bang out microwave popcorn in about two minutes. And that smells good, too. And there's a lot of salt in our microwave popcorn, so it smells even better, and I have addiction to salt. And so, and, but I can bang through that in two and a half minutes. When it comes to your consumption of the Word of God, are you a crock potter? Or are you a corn popper? Thank God it's the word of God. But the Bereans were allowing the word, not not the devotional, the word of God, as good as devotionals are, the actual actual words here to simmer. And it's juices, if you will, the activity of the spirit to begin to work its roots so that fruits, I know I'm mixing metaphors, it's all confusing, but begin to work its wonder in you. Microwaving popcorn, yeah, some word gets in me, but it, it, it's, it's gone pretty quickly. And it's, it's, sometimes its residue only lasts until I wash my hands of its salt. I don't think, and I may be wrong, I don't think in times of uncertainty, where beliefs are being challenged, that a diet of the Word of God that looks more like microwaving popcorn will have the reasonableness to stand up and remain firm. But I do believe by grace that as we more like a crock pot allow the Word of God, both entire books as well as specific verses, have its work in wonder through the work it does, oh, we will be persuaded. And more importantly, we'll be changed will become like the one who spoke the word. One of my challenges, I don't believe it's yours, but I was challenged by this recently by someone when it came to my feeding on the word of God. I was telling him how stern I was by Dave's sermon. And this brother who's trying to be helpful said, that's great. And he asked me, how are you being changed by the sermon you heard? last week. I don't like that question. I just want to tell you how stirred I was. I was stirred. That was a great message. But were you changed? I really don't like you anymore. It's not that I stopped believing the word of God, but I rushed on to the next thing, didn't I? Friend, beware of doing what I've done too often, of coming to church and being stirred but not changed. Feeling a little something. And I thank God that something's probably Jesus. But if you only get a little bit of Jesus, like an inoculation, you're not getting the real thing. And we want the real thing, don't we? And lastly, they got the word as a way of life every day. Third and last suggestion, I know there's four. Why did they search the Word of God every day, whether it was for five minutes or 10 minutes or longer than that? They searched the Word of God because they believed that the Bible had answers for them, that it was relevant for them, that it would help them discern the truth for them. And because of what they believed about the Word of God, they practiced what they believed about the Word of God in how they postured themselves before it every day. I still run out to the mailbox when the mailman comes because I believe there's something in the mailbox that has news for me. It's usually a bill. It's bad news. But sometimes, like yesterday, there was a note from a former student. And I was so excited to get it. There wasn't a gift card. That's okay. But I was still excited to get it. It was good news. This is good news. And it's in, so to speak, our mailbox every day. In fact, it's eternal news, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And our behavior towards it is an indication, not only of our belief about the scriptures, but of our anticipation that the eternal one, the savior, the brokenhearted one, the one who was with me, the king of kings 
has good news to speak to me every day. That's why they searched the scriptures every day. Friends, if we are to be the people of Christ, we must be a people of the book. For wherever there is believing, there are reasons for our believing. Wherever there is believing, there is resistance to belief due to bias and personal prejudice. Wherever there is believing, it must be the scriptures that are given the last word. To God be the glory, and may his word have its full way. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for how deeply you love us and how personally your love for us is expressed frequently in this treasure, your scriptures. We pray, Lord, you would renew our confidence where we are prone to wander and doubt of your desire and ability to meet us there. And we pray, Lord, that we would open our hearts to give you the final word in the word of God to the glory of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen.